Here we are. Uh, this is part three of chapter three. First part was freedom. Second part was slavery. Third part is economics. Uh, economics with the um, dank David Ricardo meme here. Uh, David Ricardo, very famous 18th century political economist, English. Um, and you want to get real deep into nerd meme humor, you'll find this very funny. Uh, he wrote about cloth and wine and trade them, and that's how mercantile trade can work. You guys make the cloth, we make the wine. Um, anyway, it's mercantilism. That is the order of the day in this time period. So a little review. What is mercantilism? This cartoon, obviously not from the 18th century, from later. Um, but it uh, illustrates the point nonetheless. It's not capitalism. Uh, it evolves into capitalism, or capitalism emerges out of it in a kind of dialectical way. Um, it, the point of it is to make the state rich, to enrich the state. However, it is managed by private joint stock companies, companies that people can invest in. Um, and the people that run those companies make a lot of money, and uh, increasingly, merchants who engage in mercantile trade want to make even more money. Um, so we can see how um, capitalism, free market ideas emerge out of mercantilism. Um, if, right, people don't want to trade, if people don't want to trade with you, you got the military, English, Dutch, whomever it is, to back you up. Um, so that's nice. Uh, that helps your free trade a lot. Um, European nations is a global scramble for territory. Mercantilism believes that global wealth is finite, so you got to get it before the next person does. Um, and then lastly, um, I think your book mentions this point that this is about economics. I mean, obviously, um, but in previous generations, maybe not anymore, uh, or maybe when you were in middle school, I don't know, someone could bring this up in, in class if you remember. Um, it was about, ooh, exploration, right? That, you know, whether it's Columbus or Sir Francis Drake or Vasto, Vasco da Gama or um, uh, you name it, John Rolfe, um, uh, Adam Smith, uh, writing about the stuff. Uh, it's about economics, right? These people aren't getting on boats to go just explore the world. Um, uh, it's about economics. Okay, wage labor. This is a bit of new information. Uh, wage labor, something we take for granted in the 21st century, uh, it's a relatively new concept. Um, traditionally, right, we're, we're talking, we're only about a hundred some, couple hundred years out of feudalism. Um, so wages are a pretty new idea working for someone else. Um, this is largely due to uh, enclosure, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, people don't have, don't live on feudal estates anymore. They get kicked out, they move into cities, they start working for wages. Uh, people don't like it. The traditional understanding, at least in England, the traditional understanding of freedom means that you own land. Uh, this tension between owning land and, have, and being independent as an independent farmer or freeholder, or working for a wage, that tension is going to be central to the next couple hundred years uh, uh, that we learn about, right? Up into and in, up and through Jefferson, through Jackson, uh, into even the Civil War and after this debate about uh, what constitutes freedom and what is the place of a wage in a republic, very important. So keep that in mind, that this is, we're in the, in the 1700s is a relatively new concept. People don't like it any anymore in 1830. Uh, why is wage labor a new thing? Because of the enclosure movement. Lots of poor people kicked off rural estates, uh, move into cities. There's all kinds of vagrancy laws against their presence. Their very presence is criminalized just by being there and being poor, they're breaking the law. Um, what do you do with them? Send them to the new world. Uh, indentured servants, uh, you know, prison abolition, if you're Oglethorpe, right, experiments in reforming people, uh, having them uh, 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 be farmers. So in a lot of ways, what's happening in the colonies is a kind of recreation of something that's disappearing in England, um, almost like the feudal relationship between, right, 
landed aristocracy and then people working for them, um, whether they're enslaved laborers, indentured servants, uh, freeholding whites, etc. Okay, key features of this time period, again, in terms of economics, again, uh, image in the background, not from the 18th century, from later, uh, bales of cotton. Um, when we talk about mercantilism, it can sound pretty ham-fisted, the way that they think about economics, right? From exchanging cloth for wine, or thinking global resources are finite. Um, it just, a lot of it kind of seems very simplistic. However, in this time period, they start to develop more advanced understandings of capital and how money circulates and the role of money in uh, financing empire. Uh, and to that end, uh, they start developing ideas of credit and securities, right? So credit being lending, right? Lending someone money and then securities being things you can invest in to try to make a profit. Um, so with respect to lending practices, um, people start lending, uh, in your book points out at the very beginning of this latter third of the chapter, uh, they start um, lending to uh, enslavers in the Caribbean, right? People who own human property and sugar plantations. Uh, so the, they can get credit to buy more enslaved laborers, buy more land, buy more machinery, what have you, um, because they are lent money by banks in big financial uh, uh, banks in the Netherlands, but also England, um, and then a lesser degree, other countries. Really, the Netherlands is the big one, and then England. Um, so credit, that's a pretty advanced thing, considering people are sailing around in wooden boats, right? Um, other financial vehicles. So like a financial vehicle is a fancy word for like a thing you can invest in and make money without working, right? Um, uh, Mortgage-backed securities are a financial vehicle, bonds, stocks, uh, pyramid schemes, whatever, right? Uh, with things that you can invest your money in that will make you, that make having money make more money, right? There's any number of financial vehicles you can, you can invest in. Um, so one of the most kind of uh, uh, central to this economic system is a, uh, a credit economy that uses enslaved laborers as collateral. Collateral being like when you buy a house, you get a mortgage, right? The bank gives you a bunch of money, but your house is collateral. So if you don't pay the mortgage, if you don't pay the bank back that money, they take your house, right? Um, or you can get like a car loan, right? If you don't have access to credit and you want to be um, uh, taken advantage of, which is what car loans and payday lenders do. They exploit poor people. Um, but you need to get money, you know, cash fast, as it were. Uh, you put your car up for collateral, you get a loan with a usurious interest rate, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So collateral is that thing that you put up to right, even out the loan. Um, and enslaved workers are used as collateral. So this is a really interesting idea. Um, I'll put a uh, link uh, to an article from Forbes that talks about uh, enslaved laborers and kind of the first bond market. So if you're interested in the history of economics, um, this might be something to look into, a kind of dark, macabre backstory to, um, uh, uh, to trading, credit, uh, collateral, and stuff like that. So that's all pretty advanced stuff. On the other hand, we also have these old-school mercantilist policies. In England, the Navigation Acts are the acts that are supposed to govern the mercantile economy, right? The laws of trade, the rules of uh, mercantile trade. Um, England's a long way from the colonies. Uh, it's not worth it. England's fighting either with itself or with France or with Spain or you name it. Um, they're not going to bother. You know, money keeps on coming in. Uh, so they basically uh, begin a period of salutary neglect. So salutary neglect is from the mid-17th century, 1650s, 40s, 50s, um, on up to basically the beginning of the revolutionary period at the end of the French and Indian War, 1750s. So it's a hundred years where they're not enforcing the laws. Um, the Navigation Acts aren't enforced. And knowing what all of these things mean is really, really important. Right, because if you get a DBQ or if you get on the AP exam some kind of question about Navigation Act, salutary neglect, you need to know how they're related. 
right? The Navigation Acts are the laws, but the laws aren't enforced, and that is called salutary neglect. And when salutary neglect is no longer in play, when England wants to enforce the laws again, right, the colonists start rebelling. Uh, so that's really, really important. Um, but they're making tons of money. They don't care, right? Um, and again, salutary neglect. Think about that. what that means, right? What is if something salutary? It means it's good for you, salubrious. It's good for your salud. It's good for your health, right? Salutary neglect. So they are neglecting the Navigation Acts, right? And it's beneficial to the English, right? Just don't worry about it. Don't just look the other way for now. Other stuff, um, 1650, you can't even get people to go, right? They've got to force indentured servants to go work there. They try to hoodwink them into working longer contracts. In Virginia, they initiate this headright system, which gives people 50 acres of land if you can pay someone else's way. So it's a win-win. If you're wealthy, you get more land and you get some poor schmuck coming over on an indenture. You're paying their way. Um, uh, the Halfway Covenant, which I don't think is mentioned in your book, weirdly. It's like, in terms of the history of the Puritans, kind of important. Uh, the Puritan church in Massachusetts stopped being so strict uh, about um, conversion and having a conversion experience. Uh, they say, hey, look, you don't have a conversion experience, but you're baptized. That's fine. The kids can get baptized. Um, so they're starting to pull back a little bit. Uh, because people don't want to go, right? They don't want to go and they're like not into it. They don't want to wear the buckle shoes and the funny hats and they don't want to, to do the whole Puritan thing, right? Bacon's Rebellion, right? This signals a turning point in um, labor history, right? We, we talk about Bacon's Rebellion. We talk about slavery, uh, indentured servants, but let's remember what this is. It's a labor history. It's a history of labor and the way that colonists in Virginia, in this case, um, thought about labor, um, and then they switched from right, indentured to uh, enslaved. By 1750, things are booming. Um, cities are growing. Uh, artisan trades are accelerating. Mercantile acts are hindering, to some extent, the colonial economy. The Wool Act, the Hat Act, the Currency Act doesn't take a real genius to figure what these one figure out what these ones target. Uh, can't make your own. Can't spin your own wool. Can't make your own hats. In the colonies, no hats. You got to buy your hats from England, um, and you can't make your own currency. So, in a hundred years' time, we go from um, difficult to get people to go to a burgeoning and emerging colonial scene where people are making money, uh, the economy is expanding, people are investing in all kinds of things, enslaved labor, uh, uh, land, etc. Um, that is chapter three. So, for the teaser. For next time, chapter four, in the beginning pages of chapter four, you see old, uh, old uh, Reverend Whitfield uh, giving you that hot fire sermon. Uh, so I thought it only appropriate that we um, uh, have our own modern day uh, um, preacher of sorts superimposed upon the past. So that is coming up next time.